All right, today we're going to talk about centering methods, so how we actually go through the process of centering, uh, and then we're also going to talk about the mechanisms, so on a microstructural level, what is happening um, to our ceramic. So let's start with methods. And so let's start with the question. Um, so think of all the different types of furnaces or whatever you want to call it that can actually center a ceramic part. So see if you can come up with like a list um, of various types of furnaces and other things that could be used to center a ceramic part. So take a second and come back and we'll discuss. Okay. So here um, I have a list uh, that we're going to talk about today. Um, again, as always, uh, when I give these lists, uh, I'm not trying to give a um, definitive list of all the different types. That is not possible. Um, and so we're just going to talk about some of the common and then some of the maybe more specialized versions. Uh, and so the way we break these up uh, and the way I'm going to characterize them or classify these is by the heating mechanism. And so the first type is combustion. So this is very common on a industrial scale uh, when we have some type of uh, fuel like natural gas or propane or gasoline, whatever it may be. Um, and that is our fuel source for heating up uh, a chamber. Um, on the lab scale and sometimes on uh, the, sm the smaller scale, uh, the more common method is uh, resistive heating. So this is uh, an electrical um, element uh, that um, it passes th current through it, uh, it heats up through resistance, and that is what uh, heats up our part. And there are also some uh, more specialized uh, and unique uh, forms of heating that I kind of lump together in one category. So we can actually use microwaves, we can use radio uh, frequencies, and we can also use um, IR and UV uh, wavelengths as well uh, in certain applications. Okay, so uh, another way that we can sort of classify these furnaces is by the loading type, so how we actually load samples into them. And so the first type is periodic or batch. So this is, again, more common on a lab scale. Here I've shown a picture of a box uh, furnace. So this is where we'd have a few ceramic parts that we want to center. We put them in the furnace, close it up, start the program, and then uh, when it's finished, take them out, and then we can start over again uh, as uh, individual batches. Right, So this is useful on the lab side where we're probably making small quantities of things. Um, but as you might imagine, on the industrial scale, this is not usually the best way to, to make large quantities of things. And so they prefer a continuous furnace. And so this is where instead of having a box furnace, we would have a, a furnace uh, with various um, zones. Uh, within it. So you kind of see different zones here with different um, columns. Um, and then we have sort of a conveyor belt system. And so the furnace um, is stationary and the part goes through the various heating zones of this continuous furnace. And so it allows us to have a continuous supply, supply of uh, specimens that we can center. And so this is much more feasible for large scale um, applications. And so this is just kind of showing the conveyor belt portion where they're inserted on this end and then they move through the conveyor belt, move through the different zones, which would mimic the program that we can set a smaller furnace to. Okay, so let's sort of focus on maybe some of the different batch furnaces that you might see uh, in a laboratory setting. And so in our MSC undergrad lab, we have both of these types. Um, we frequently use them for ceramic testing. For example, in the superconductor lab, we frequently use both of these types. Uh, box furnace is uh, named because it kind of looks like a box. Um, this is what I showed in the periodic um, uh, furnace uh, from the previous slide. Um, it's a box furnace. Uh, we open and close the, the door, we put our samples in, um, and it's uh, basically uh, vented 
typically on the top or the back. Um, and so it's open to uh, the atmosphere in the lab. So typically this is going to be air. Um, so that means a certain percentage of oxygen based on your altitude. Um, and so we don't have much control over the atmosphere uh, inside this furnace. And the reason I bring this up is because the other type um, has a lot more control over atmosphere, and that's the point. So this is a tube furnace. We also have one of these. This is actually pretty similar to the one we have in the lab. Um, it's named a tube furnace because it typically ha it will have a tube running through the center. Uh, the boxy portion of this is what actually has the heating elements. So basically this uh, quartz tube here is heated externally by the elements uh, on top and bottom of the uh, tube. Um, and then the sample actually goes within the tube. And the reason we have this tube shape is because this allows for easy flow of different gases and atmospheres through the tube. And it allows us to control it in a very uh, controlled way. So this basically has valves on either side to control the gas that goes in and out. Whereas the box furnace has very little control over um, what goes in and out of the furnace. It's kind of constricted to, um, to the design. And so this makes it easy to control um, if we don't wanna run something in air environment. We could run this in pure oxygen. We could run this in an inert gas. We could run it in some type of reducing species like hydrogen gas. There's lots of options and a lot of control. We can even, uh, uh, a lot of times these are set up so where we could actually pull a vacuum. And so we could just get rid of as much gas uh, from the tube as possible. So the idea here is just to maintain control over the atmosphere and then it flows through the tube. All right, so in the continuous furnace, uh, I, I showed you a little bit, uh, a real picture of one, but this is more of a schematic just showing you uh, what can happen in here. And the idea is that it shows the various um, stages that we can have. So basically in this case, this is for glass. And so uh, we have the raw batch coming in um, on the, uh, the left side here. Uh, it goes through the initial chamber here. Uh, and then, um, uh, so that's basically where the glass is. And so then the conveyor belt portion comes here. And so this is uh, a float bath. And so basically the glass is floated on a, a liquid. Uh, but the idea is that we have a heat zone. We have a, a fire polishing zone. We have a cooling zone. And so we're able to control the heat in these different zones. And so if we wanted to, for example, start at a low temperature, heat it up to a higher temperature, and then cool it down again, we can do that with multiple zones. And so that mimics uh, the setting of a program in smaller furnaces. And then again, uh, here, uh, down here, there's even an annealing uh, zone as well. So we have a lot of different capabilities with this continuous type furnace. Okay, so now to sort of some of the other types of uh, heating elements. Um, one of them is inductive furnaces. So this, I've kind of shown you a couple of examples here. So on the left, this is an actual furnace uh, that has inductive heating. Um, basically the idea here is that we use magnetic field um, to heat conductive element, uh, objects. And so um, we're using a magnetic field uh, that in, uh, induces uh, electric um, current in the sample, therefore resistively he heating just the conductive uh, object. And so this is obviously limited um, to conductive uh, objects. So not as common for a lot of ceramics, but we could use it for conductive ceramics. This would be more common in metallic systems. And I show uh, an example here on the right because this is an inductive stovetop. So uh, most people don't have this type in their house. Uh, it's a little less common. It's a little bit more expensive, but it's the same idea as this. So on the inductive stovetops, it works the same way. We use a magnetic field uh, to heat the pan because the pan is conductive. So we can are limited in this case to conductive uh, objects. Uh, but the reason I put this, I, th I thought this was a good illustration, is that if we put the, um, the object we're actually trying to cook in the, the, the pot, if we just put that on the inductive stovetop, um, 
it doesn't heat up because that is not conductive. It's only heating up the pan, the conductive portion. And so um, this is a, a good safety uh, mechanism because it's only heating conductive samples. So if you were to put your hand on the, the, the stove top, um, there's less of a risk um, of, of burns. So that's uh, what we have uh, inductive stove tops, but the same principle as a furnace using that equipment. Um, some other mechanisms, uh, microwave furnaces, uh, they use these higher frequencies that we have than uh, uh, radio frequencies. Um, and so this can uh, heat up um, polar molecules like water. So it is frequently used uh, to, to do that. That's what the, how, that's how the, the uh, household microwave works. Uh, but there's also more lab grade, which are higher power um, than home made. Uh, but I will say that if you look up some papers on um, uh, synthesis or, or uh, um, heat treatments or anything like that using microwave technology, um, a lot of times labs will in fact just use a household uh, microwave uh, and instead of a laboratory grade. I've definitely seen household ones used uh, for certain syntheses and, and so forth.